Hi, this is Crave from Behringer, a semi-modular analog monosynth based on their 3340 oscillator and ladder filter with a single LFO and envelope, a sequencer and a 32-jack Eurorack compatible patch bay priced at around $200. Now, the market for analog synths at this price is getting pretty heated up, so let's see how Crave compares. Before we start, a couple of quick disclaimers. This is a pre-release beta version that Behringer sent over as a loan. Now, I'm told the only thing that will change between now and Crave's release is firmware updates and bug fixes, so the overall layout and sound are here to stay. If you're from the future and something has changed, please comment below and I'll add that to the description and I will of course add anything I find out as well. The second thing I think is important to note up front is that while from a design perspective Crave looks quite new, the patch bay on top, the color scheme and the name aren't hinting at a clone, but as I dug into it I started getting a strong feeling of deja vu. Its workflow and routing, patch bay jacks and sequencer and settings are heavily inspired or directly imported from Moog's Mother32. That said, things have been rearranged and a few features have been added and unlike Mother32, Crave is not mountable inside a Eurorack case, but rather it's a desktop only unit. With all that said, let's get started with an overview. First, in terms of size, Crave isn't as small as it looks, at least not to me when I saw it in videos. Just to get a sense of scale because a lot of people have seen Volcas, it's sort of like almost, I think, uh, 40 or 50% taller than a Volca and maybe three quarters wider as long as we're using Volcas as the unit of measurement. And like I mentioned, it is taller than Eurorack modules, so this will not fit in a Eurorack case. Despite the price, the build feels very solid. The body is metal, it has wooden cheeks, and the knobs feel very solid in place. The buttons are a little bit clicky, uh, but they seem very solid. They're nicely backlit and responsive. In terms of connectivity, front and center obviously is the 32 jack patch bay, 16 outs and 16 ins, both for rewiring Crave as well as connecting it to external Eurorack gear or even other semi-modular synths, and I'll show you a few patching ideas later on. Crave has MIDI in, and it's great that it also has MIDI through, so you can chain more gear without a splitter. Crave also has a USB port in the back, both for MIDI in and out over USB, but not for audio or power, nor can it serve as a host for USB MIDI keyboards. That said, it does send out MIDI notes polyphonically if you're in a pinch for a keyboard, though the sequencer itself isn't polyphonic. There's no quarter inch line out, but you do have both a headphone jack and the VCA output can serve as line out as well. Crave also has an on-off switch, which is great, but it's very light to the touch. I found myself accidentally turning it off more than once when plugging in cables uh, into jacks in this area, though I guess any position along the back would have been susceptible to that. The front panel is very well laid out and quite spacious with the oscillator filter and VCA section on top, then the envelope, LFO, and utility, and then finally the arpeggiator and sequencer section. Now, Crave is a monosynth. But aside from the obvious oscillator as a sound source, the filter does self-oscillate and can be played, as well as the LFO with some caveats I'll talk about later, so it can be seen as a sort of paraphonic synth, more on that in the patch ideas section of this video. Okay, let's dive into the various sections, we'll start with the oscillator. Crave's oscillator is a 3340 based chip, like the ones you can find in Behringer's Neutron, and it's an emulation of a chip that can be found in many synths, including the original Prophet 5. You've got two core shapes, saw and variable pulse width square. The oscillators have an eight octave range with another octave on the frequency knob and it goes quite low all the way down to a uh, definitely an LFO rate if you want that. And yeah, as I've reviewed this oscillator before, it sounds pretty good. This is the sawtooth, and like I mentioned, it has a variable width square or pulse waveform. Goes all the way to very thin, 
and can be modulated both using the patch bay as well as with the internal routing. So switch the mod destination to width, source as an LFO, and you can get nice pulse width modulation at the rate of the LFO. Goes through zero if you want that. Aside from the oscillator with its shapes, Crave also has a built-in noise generator and you can control the mix between the noise generator and the oscillator using this knob. And you can replace the noise with external audio with a patch bay. Now aside from modulation using the patch bay, the oscillator section has its own mini mod matrix with either pulse width or frequency as the modulation destination and either the LFO or the envelope or alternately a oscillator mod input in the patch bay as a mod source. So you already saw me modulate the pulse width with the LFO. You can modulate the frequency with the LFO, for example, as well. So this can go to anything from a gentle vibrato all the way to all the way to harsh FM sounds. And you could also use the envelope as a mod source, which could do plenty of things, anything from, say, a simple pitch bend, all the way to, if you wanted, uh, laser beams. You could do that too. So that's the oscillator section. Let's move on to the filter. The filter is a classic 24 dB per octave ladder filter. This is what it sounds like on a sawtooth without any resonance. It has both a low pass and high pass mode. And like traditional ladder filters, the minute you bring up resonance, there is a substantial drop in level and resonance does self-oscillate. Now, this filter is the same filter as in Behringer's Model D synth, and yeah, it sounds good. Now, just in case you're new to filters, and I would assume that some people buying Crave might be, and I'll demo this on noise, a low-pass filter filters out frequencies above the cutoff frequency. Right? And a high-pass filter does the opposite, filters out frequencies below the cutoff point. And then resonance is an emphasis or amplification of whatever audio is at the cutoff point. Let's bring down the noise. The filter has a few modulation options like the oscillator. So while you can modulate it with anything, by default it's also connected either to the LFO or to the envelope. So you can make anything from automatic wobbles. Right, with the LFO, that's a repetitive modulation. Or you can create one-time modulations with the envelope. So let's take, for example, decay. Right, decay is a quick modulation down of the cutoff frequency. Right, I could do the opposite with an attack, bring it up. And the this little mod matrix is bipolar, so if I flip the switch to negative, then attack and decay will do the opposite, right? So I need to bring this up, right? Attack will be a downward motion, and decay will be an upward motion. Now, by default, the filter does not track the keys that you play on the keyboard. That is something you may want to do 
to get consistency in your modulation or to play the filter like an oscillator, I'll get to that when we get to the patch tricks section. And one more note for people that may be newer to synths, the mod depth determines how far the modulation motion goes, right? So this applies both to the VCO and to the filter. The higher this goes, the deeper the motion, and the lower the mod depth, the more subtle the modulation, down to nothing. Before we move to the modulation source section, the output section is pretty straightforward. There's level and there's a switch to turn the VCA on so that you can, you know, just play drones or mess around with sounds without having to trigger the VCA envelope. So let's talk about the envelope. The envelope is a modulation source, right? You can modulate the filter with it, you can modulate pulse width with it, or anything else through the patch bay. By default, the envelope is connected to the VCA. The envelope is set up as either a two-stage envelope or a four-stage envelope. It's got attack time, right? So how long it takes the audio to get to its maximum level. Right? So slow attack will bring the sound in gradually. And then it's got decay, a low decay will bring it down quickly and a long decay will take its time obviously. With a two stage envelope, it doesn't matter how long you press a key, you just trigger the envelope and the envelope takes as long as the attack time together with the decay time. Turning on sustain brings in two additional stages to the VCA envelope, a decay stage to the sustain level and then a release time from when you leave a note. So as long as you keep a note pressed, right, it'll play at the sustain level. The attack still works and decay is the time that it takes the level to get to the sustain level. And then once you leave the note, decay turns into release. Now again, for the sake of beginners, this does apply to the VCA envelope by default, but it also applies to any other modulation we route the envelope to, right? So any parameter that we control will behave like the envelope curve, whether it's the filter cutoff, the VCO frequency or pulse width, or anything else we connect the envelope to using the patch bay. Let's move on to the LFO or modulation section, but this is really just the LFO and don't forget the envelope is a modulation source as well. So the LFO is basically a simple back and forth knob turner that has a couple of ways of turning or flicking knobs around. The best way to demonstrate this is to forward the LFO to the oscillator pitch. So if I turn the mod depth down, the LFO doesn't do anything. Let's increase its rate. As I increase the mod depth, Right? The LFO, in this case a triangle LFO, will move the pitch of the oscillator back and forth. The more I increase the mod depth, the deeper the motion, the more I increase the LFO rate, the faster the modulation, and this goes into audio rates like I showed you before. And the LFO has two shapes, either a triangle or a square. And you can set the mod depth to play different note intervals this way, which is a cool little trick. Now, because the LFO goes into audio rates, you might ask whether it's good not only for FM synthesis style sounds, but also to be played as its own oscillator. Now, the answer is yes and no. In this unit, it's slightly off from one volt per octave. Each volt sent through the keyboard goes to about 11 semitones. Again, in this unit, Behringer says that in the final units that ship, it will be calibrated to volt per octave. We'll try this out later when we get to the patching tip section. Let's move on to the utilities section. Part one is glide, which slews between note values. Now, Glide is always on when you play notes live using the internal or an external keyboard. There's no way to enable Glide only for legato notes, at least not currently. However, you do have slide control on a per step basis in the sequencer. We'll get to that in a bit. VC Mix is a mixer control knob for the two inputs in the patch bay that by default doesn't do anything, isn't pre-routed to anything unless you connect something to the mixer output in the patch bay. The mix two input, by the way, is normaled internally, connected internally to a five volt signal. That's why it says high and low here. So if you turn this knob all the way clockwise, you'll get five volts out of the VC mix output. 
All right, let's talk about the sequencer and arpeggiator section. As you saw before, you've got octave control here. Now, as I mentioned before, these keys are a little bit too clicky and sort of hard to press, so they're not great for a performance of playing something live, but for entering notes and transposing sequences, they do fine. Before we talk about the sequencer, let's talk about the arpeggiator. It's quite simple and useful. It has two modes. You either turn it on and it will play the pattern as long as you hold the notes down, or if you tap it twice when you turn it on, it will hold patterns for you. And you can play patterns across several octaves if you just hold one of the notes, transpose up an octave, right? You can play cross octave patterns, and you've got eight arpeggiator patterns which you change using the shift key. Down, up, down, random, and then a few multiple octave options. So that was the arpeggiator. Let's talk about Crave's sequencer. Now, the sequencer can store 64 sequences of up to 32 steps each. It's relatively straightforward, though there are some cryptic key combinations for essential functions. For example, if you want to reset a sequence, you have to hold shift, reset, and pattern bank. Now, you can't play a sequence live into the sequencer, but you can punch it in step by step. If you hit the record button, just type in a sequence and it will play back. Now, like I mentioned, the sequencer supports up to 32 steps. Since these eight pads represent eight steps, I can page through four groups of eight pads. If I want to set a sequence length of, say, 16 steps, I could go to shift set end and hit the eighth pad on the second page. And now my sequence will have 16 steps. All right, this is page two. I could view page one as well. Let's set it back to eight steps. Now, another way to change notes in the sequence is to hold shift and the pad that represents the note. So if this is my sequence and I wanted to change this note, I just hold shift, it'll start to blink, and then I could edit the note to a different note. Let's say go down an octave and play this. Right? Now, on a per step basis, there are actually five things that we can determine for each individual step. The first is the gate length. Now, you need to be in sustain on mode for that. Right? And it goes anything from a tie when all eight LEDs are lit up down to very short notes, depending, of course, on your decay and sustain and tack settings. And if you're familiar with either the Mother 32's sequencer or VO3 sequencers, you also have on a per step basis access to glide, ratchet, and accent. So let's start changing things on a per step basis. If you turn this knob, you'll notice this lead turn on. Right? And then it will glide into this note. Even though it's a knob, there really are only two positions, on or off. And the glide rate is determined by the global glide, right? It can be either short or longer. The second thing you can change on a per step basis is ratchets, and you do that by holding shift and turning the glide knob. Look at these LEDs here. You can have two ratchets, three ratchets, or four ratchets per step. And then the third thing you can determine on a per step basis is accent. And you can try this out even when the sequencer isn't running. This is a non-accented note, and this is an accented note. And you'll notice immediately the increase in level, but that's not the only thing that happens. If I turn the filter somewhere around the middle and crank up resonance a little bit, right? Then the second aspect of accent comes into play, which is a slight filter modulation, right? Without and with that little depending on resonance, bark that is added, right? Sort of like the 303. So anyway, going back to this magical pattern, I could choose any step, let's say step one, and then add an accent to it. This lead turns on, right? To add accent to another one. Why not here as well? Right? Right? 
So that is that distinctive accent. So we talked about five things per step. We talked about gate length, the glide, ratchet, accent, and the fifth thing is a rest. You just click rest and it will mute that step. All right, or bring it back in. So that's how you enter and edit notes. Now, when you're not entering or editing notes, there are two sequencer modes, either keyboard or step. Now, these names really confused me in the beginning, both here and in the Mother 32. I prefer to look at these names as mute and transpose. So if you go into step mode, which is really mute mode, you can just mute several notes in your pattern. There's also a little trick here that lets you cycle through the notes when you press these buttons. Right, but generally step mode really is just muting out steps and then keyboard mode, which I prefer to call just transpose modes, will let you transpose a sequence right, to any place you like and you can transpose the sequence when you have an external keyboard connected through MIDI through the keyboard as well. Now there are a few global controls when you run a sequence. So you could, for example, activate ratchets for all the steps, right, with this sort of turn of this knob with shift while the sequence is running. You've got tempo control. And if you hold shift and this knob, you've got swing control. And this goes all the way from extreme swing to completely taking out of the pattern every even note or every odd note, which is a nice little jamming trick with this. So that is pretty much Crave's sequencer. Okay, let's explore the patch bay and talk about a few patching ideas, tips, and tricks. First of all, anything you send in through MIDI comes out the patch bay through the keyboard CV as volt for octave pitch control, through the gate output for when a note is on or off, and out the assign output. Now, if you're familiar with Mother32, then you'll be very familiar with this. There are two kinds of signals you could send out. One is the various MIDI options that this has, like mod wheel, velocity, and a few MIDI CCs. And the second type of signal you could send out the assign output is sequencer synced voltage modulations or CV modulations with my favorite probably being a random voltage level or sample and hold for each step of the sequencer. Now there are two ways to control what is assigned to the assign output. One is with a rather cryptic combination of shift, hold and eight and you've got two types of parameters here. You want the second page and then the eight pads without shift represent uh, the sequencer options and then with a shift represents various MIDI options. So pad eight, for example, is the sample and hold. And once you set that, you can exit this mode. That's pretty complex. Luckily, Behringer have provided a companion software that lets you very easily configure this via MIDI. Now I'll program in a simple one note pattern to demonstrate this. So once I get my pattern going with a little reverb, why not? If I go out the assign output and then say, go into the filter cutoff, I'll get this random modulation of the filter cutoff, which is pretty cool. Right, and I could patch that to anything, right? So I could patch it, say, to the mix CV between the oscillator and noise. Right, which is nice. Let's go back to cutoff. So the assign output, while it can be connected to a few MIDI modulation sources, is also a really nice tempo synced LFO because this LFO can't be synced to the sequencer's tempo. And the options are, like I mentioned before, either sample and hold, and if you hold that key combination, right, and edit, uh, you can choose, let's see if I can play this, yeah, any one of the options. But this is sort of like a triangle, saw LFO, ramp, and there are various clock synced options. A nice additional LFO synced to the sequencer. So let's talk about a few tricks with the patch bay. The first is that you can use the mix knob as an attenuator. So this modulation may be a little bit too extreme for me. Right? Certainly if I connected it to say oscillator pitch, right? 
that would be pretty much all over the place. So I can take this cable, plug it into mix two, right, replacing the normal the five volt input, and then take the output of the mixer, plug that into, say, the oscillator, right, and then seriously attenuate, play down these variations, right, all the way to nothing. So aside from a mixer for audio or regular voltage levels, there's a nice attenuator here as well. Now that's gonna come in very handy when we start talking about playing the filter or the LFO. So let's talk about the filter first, right? It will self oscillate and is potentially playable. If I don't wanna hear the oscillator, I can just plug a dummy cable into the external audio and turn this all the way clockwise. So now we're just getting a Morse code signal. Now the trick to playing the filter is connecting the keyboard CV out to the filter cutoff. And you can play the filter. Now, if you're lucky and your filter is properly calibrated, that's all you'll need. Here, it's a bit off. Again, I don't know if in the production units this will be calibrated to volt per octave or not, but here I've got sort of like a, uh, a flat over here and an A over here. Now, because this range is more than an octave, the solution to precisely tracking with the filter, as you may have guessed from the attenuator intro, is to pass this through an attenuator. So now if I take the mixer output into the cutoff, I can adjust this range, right? And if I just slightly attenuate it, so let's say I try and get this to C just for the heck of it, and then Right, this is slightly out of tune. And if you play with these back and forth, you can get, let's settle for that, pretty nicely tuned. And this will track nicely, you know, across a few octaves. You can be as precise as you want with this. Now this is cool, I think, for a number of reasons. First, it's another tone coming out of your synth, right? You might want a nice sine wave in addition to the saw and pulse. So this is nice standalone, but as you know, I'm a fan of paraphonic synths, so we can now bring in our oscillator back and tune it to any interval we like. Right? And I think this really opens up the synth. Aside from any interval you like, if you have an external CV source, you can play two different notes paraphonically as you wish. The disadvantage to using the filter as another oscillator is that you sort of lose the filtering aspect of the filter, plus you need to make sure that the cutoff point is higher than the oscillator if you're in low-pass mode. Otherwise, you'll filter out the main oscillator. You can, however, if you like, play the filter in high-pass mode as well, so it won't filter out the higher notes. All right, so the filter does resonate also in high-pass mode. When you crank up the resonance like this, it actually stops doing any filtering at all in high-pass mode and just plays the resonance. So you can play that alongside an oscillator and have the entire frequency range open if you like. While we're on the topic of the high-pass filter, take the VCF output, plug that into the external audio, and you can get really nice, aggressive feedback from it with a much more pronounced resonance. While we're on this topic, the ladder filter is generally considered to be a nice, creamy, smooth filter. I mean, you can obviously crank up resonance and get a little bit of aggression out of it, but it is kind of tame compared to other filters. However, if you take the VCF output and plug it into the VCF cutoff, you can change its character right, to something slightly less polite. Right, this is after, <laughs> this is before. Right, quite a difference. Let's move on. I promised you I'd talk about playing the LFO, so let's plug that into the external audio. There are two LFO shapes, as we mentioned before, you've got both of them accessible in the patch bay. Let's take a triangle, for example, plug that into external audio in. 
So this is our regular oscillator and now we can hear the LFO. Now it's at low rates here, so we can't hear it, but as we increase the LFO rate, it'll gradually go into audio rates. Now this goes up to say 360 Hertz, but you can push it further with external voltage. I'll do that with a keyboard input, plug that into the LFO rate. And now I can go up to about 611 Hertz. So playing these high notes won't mean much, but if I take it down a bit, right? we can start to look at playing the LFO. Now, the problem with the LFO here is that the range that you get by sending it a one volt difference is less than an octave, not more than an octave. So you can't attenuate it. Now I've asked Behringer about this and they said that in units that actually ship, this will be calibrated to one volt per octave. Uh, I'll probably return that by then, but if you get a unit and happen to test that, please leave a comment below and let me know if it works. Now the big deal, of course, if this works well, is that you get to keep the filter, right? So you can have two oscillators, you can control them at an interval or with external CV completely separately and still have full control of the filter. Let's talk a bit about a slightly more advanced form of FM synthesis on Crave. What I'll do is disable LFO modulation directly to the oscillator CV and rather go through the oscillator FM input. Now, as you know, FM synthesis needs a modulator and a carrier. So the LFO will be our modulator and the VCO will be our carrier. Now we want a way to control modulation depth since we don't have access to the oscillator mod section, we'll need to use the mixer. So I'll pass the triangle LFO through the mixer and then connect the VC mix, the mixer output into oscillator FM, not oscillator CV. Now right away, as we increase both the oscillator modulation rate and modulation depth, we'll start getting these bell-like sounds. And if you want to kick it up a notch, you can connect the keyboard CV into the LFO rate. And this is where it starts to get even more interesting. So this won't track pitch like a DX7, but certainly you can get to quite interesting sounds. Before we move on to the pros and cons, just a quick word about the companion software. Now, while you can control most of the settings with various shift combinations, if you have a computer nearby, this can come in extremely handy to make quick settings changes. Crave also supports a polychaining mode, though of course I could not test that here. So let's take a look at the pros and cons. On the cons side, Crave is a relatively simple synth with one oscillator, one filter, one LFO, and one envelope. There are other offerings by Behringer and other companies at a similar price range with a little bit more. Regarding the sequencer, in my opinion, it's really nice that you have the glide and accent features, but 32 steps can be too few. Now, hopefully this can be extended with a future firmware update, and it wouldn't be hard to imagine eight pages of eight steps instead of just four, and I would have happily had the overall number of storable sequences reduced from 64 to 32 in exchange for longer sequences. Another con is that you can't record into the sequencer in real time, but between the keyboard and step edit modes, it's pretty easy to get what you want. Finally, as per many analog synths, but not all of them, you can't store presets on Crave, which is kind of inevitable considering the patch bay is a big part of being creative with it. Quick tip, if you want to store presets with Crave, Get your phone out, shoot a video of your sequence while it's playing, and sort of walk yourself through the important knob settings and patch bay connections. In terms of alternatives, as I mentioned before, while Crave doesn't look like a Mother 32, the actual routing, switches, sequencer, and patch bay are very similar or identical, though a few features have been added. Now, as I mentioned, Crave cannot be mounted in a 3U rack and Mother 32 can, but Mother 32 does cost more, and Crave has a few extra features like sustain level, a four-stage envelope, an arpeggiator, and a bit more, which Mother 32 doesn't have. Other analog alternatives at a similar price range are Korg's Volcas, the bass and keys probably in particular, though they are more cramped and don't have a patch bay, obviously. Uno Synth is another interesting alternative with more oscillators, presets, and a delay, but again, more cramped, far less hands-on controls, and no patch bay. On the pros side, Crave's build 
seems extremely high quality and solid, and the overall layout makes a lot of sense. It's very spacious and intuitive. The oscillator and filter sound great, and the onboard arpeggiator and sequencer are quite flexible, and the price is extremely competitive. So whether you're considering Crave as a first simple knob per function analog synth, or as a Eurorack sequencing and sound companion, it's something that's well worth looking at. Regardless of what you choose for plenty more patching ideas, tips and tricks, check out my book available to people who support this channel on Patreon. Feel free to ask me any questions in the comments section below and ring the bell after you subscribe to make sure you don't miss the next one. Hit like if this was useful. Thanks for watching.